everyone. It's uh, lovely to be with you. It's a great week for me, uh, obviously, and uh, a great privilege to be giving the lectures and also uh, to be spending uh, time here with the new collegians and the staff uh, here at New College. Um, as uh, Bill said, this is the handout you're meant to be looking at. You do you, and uh, don't read ahead. <laughs> Uh, my task in the three lectures is to compare and consider modern answers to the questions of personal identity uh, with those of the Bible. In other words, the lectures cover a topic which I dare to say is one of your favourite topics, namely you. And uh, I'll be hoping that you'll take them personally and think about your answers to the questions, who are you, what defines you, what makes you you? Uh, my understanding of the notion of personal identity will emerge as the lectures proceed, but for now just a simple uh, definition will suffice. Personal identity is the sense of self that is common to all human beings, or to quote um, the brilliant Marilyn Robinson, it's the odd privilege of existence as a coherent self and the ability to speak the word I. And as uh, John said earlier, the self and personal identity is certainly one of the most topical topics in our day. The advice to be true to yourself is uh, ubiquitous, turning up in every corner of life with everyone from Peter Singer to Beyonce, Oprah and Ellen, stressing the importance of personal autonomy and following your heart. Or to quote a recent example, think of President Donald Trump's Liberty University commencement speech earlier this year. Uh, where he counselled the bright-eyed graduates to be true to yourself and, of course, and to your country and always have the courage to be yourself. I should mention a more hip version of this mantra that I heard from a student at Ridley that is gaining currency in our world, the appealing instruction, you do you. And uh, I had to look up the Urban Dictionary to work out whether it's an insult or not. <laughs> I'm still not sure. Unsurprisingly, the arts are also in on the act of uh, um, focusing on this subject. So last month in Melbourne, the Australian Dance Theatre ran a production under the title Be Yourself. And let's hope being yourself isn't such a dangerous and angst-ridden task as this advertisement suggests. These days, self-determination, uh, rather than being a principle for nations at the end of the First World War, is the responsibility of every individual. Now, of course, to be true to yourself, for you to do you, to be yourself, you have to know who you are in the first place, don't you? And ironically, some have argued that the pressure to be true to yourself has made it more difficult than ever to know who you are. And over the years, I've had countless conversations with people of all ages in a myriad of circumstances who are wondering who they really are. People who've been made redundant, people whose parents have died, people who feel deflated by their aspirations for life not coming to fruition, people who feel diminished by consuming responsibilities for children or parents, people who feel at sea in our rapidly changing world. And I think there are, in, in, in fact, good reasons to think that identity angst, to coin a term, is on the rise in the 21st century. Even defining yourself on social media raises, I think, some serious issues. On one level, what you project of yourself on uh, one of the platforms of social media is firmly in your own hands, of course. You choose the photo, the profile description and what you post. I mean, what could be more self-made and authentic than that? It's the ultimate you do you. Yet numerous studies have raised questions about social media as a tool for identity formation. While choosing your own profile photo clearly empowers you to define yourself, as one study concluded, now that we can interact with hundreds, no thousands of people simultaneously, we've strengthened the impact that others have on our self-value. Another study found that what we think we are projecting with our profile pictures is often what, not what others perceive. And the commonly posted selfie uh, can also be problematic. It was the uh, word of the year for the Oxford English Dictionary a few years ago, and uh, we can claim credit for it. I don't know how proud you are. It came from Australia. So are selfies of the shared variety just an opportunity for self-expression? In one sense, they obviously are, 
and I confess to having uh, quite a few on my phone myself. Um, are they a reclaiming of agency in how we are portrayed? Uh, most inevitably lead to comparison with others. And as Mia Friedman put, I think, quite pointedly, in many cases, there's a blurred line between self-empowerment and self-objectification. Many selfies may well belie an unhealthy thirst for likes and praise, an attempt to boost a flagging self-esteem. Indeed, social media provides unprecedented opportunities for self-definition, but ironically, excessive use can lead to an unhealthy thirst for the approval and validation of others, to the masking rather than expressing of identity, and even in the end, I put to you, to self-doubt. And there are good reasons to agree with the theologian Kevin Van Hooser, who observed that the human race at the dawn of the third millennium, following the demise of the Christian break, uh, paradigm and the breakup of modernity, is suffering from a collective identity crisis. Now, along with self-knowledge, my focus in the three lectures will be on the process of identity formation, how a person's sense of self is formed and maintained. And as it turns out, describing the formation of the self, how you came to be you, is not an easy task. As, as Tim Keller puts it, identity formation is a process that every culture pushes on its members so powerfully and pervasively that it is invisible to us. It's like saying to a fish, let's talk about water, or to uh, a dung beetle, let's talk about manure, or to a termite, let's talk about wood. They would uh, respond uh, with some um, uh, puzzlement uh, because ba we barely notice what's being forced upon us. So even if the topic of personal identity is one of your favourite topics, uh, it's in one sense one that you've never given a thought. How then do most of us do personal identity in our day? Simply put, personal identity today is a do-it-yourself project and identity formation is the task of self-definition. Today we take for granted the obligation to find and define ourselves for ourselves, even to invent ourselves. People have what is called a buffered self, a self-defined and shaped from within to the exclusion of external roles and ties. We find our true selves, if you like, by detaching ourselves from external influences like home, family, religion, tradition, and determine who we are for ourselves. In many cases, I think the gap year is, uh, um, epitomizes that approach to identity. People leave the constricting influences of home and family and their neighborhood and head out to find themselves. The buffered self contrasts with the poorest self, which is the approach of most traditional societies, where external ties and roles are determinative for identity. Uh, with the poorest self, your sense of self and worth develop as you move out towards others, assuming roles in your family and community. Uh, the regular advice today, as New York Times columnist David Brooks puts it, is for people to follow their passion, to trust their feelings, to reflect and find their purpose in life. And I think the assumption behind these cliches, he says, is that when you are figuring out how to lead your life, the most important answers are found deep inside yourself. And popular culture certainly taps into this preoccupation with self-knowledge and self-expression. Think of the decades, lo decades long success on Madonna uh, singer, songwriter, actress, businesswoman, who embodies this approach, I think, to personal identity. Madonna is famous for regularly reinventing her music and, uh, more importantly, her image. And not surprisingly, her sixth major concert tour was styled the Reinvention World Tour. Note the intentionally opaque central image, which has given expression, sharp expression, in multiple ways um, around the edges. Personal identity today is about self-definition and self-expression. Or consider the movies of Matt Damon, which reg regularly explore themes related to questions of personal identity and self-discovery, tapping into our fascination with inscrutable characters who need to find their identity 
and this is going back a bit, but uh, think most uh, obviously of the born identity, uh, where at one point he says, I know the best place to look for a gun is the cab or the grey truck outside, and at this altitude I can run flat out for half a mile before my hands start shaking. How can I know that and not know who I am? Now, along with looking at personal identity and identity formation, in our day, we'll be considering another approach to personal identity, namely the one commended in the Bible. And of course, that's the brief of the New College Lectures to take a contemporary issue and look at it uh, from uh, the point of view of the Bible. However, this raises, I think, a potential problem. Does the Bible actually address the question of personal identity? Some of you are wondering whether you made a mistake purchasing the book at this point. <laughs> After all, identity does not appear in any modern English version of the Bible. And it could be argued that personal identity is a thoroughly modern concept about which the Bible could hardly have anything to say. A nifty Google Ngram search of the term identity formation, until recently the way to do this was to read all of English literature over the last 500 years and add it up for yourself, but now you can do it just with a click. Um, it took off in the last 50 years or so. And uh, the term personal identity uh, took a big jump in the same period, although it bumped along from the 18th century. Yet in my view, to think of an ancient collection of documents like the Bible as not interested in personal identity would be a mistake. Uh, we must not commit the fallacy of mistaking words for concepts. In fact, in terms of the history of ideas, uh, Larry Ziedentop's tour de force inventing the individual, which is on sale, I think, at the back of the room, credits Christianity for the very concept of ourselves as free agents. In the ancient world, your identity was very much as a member of a household and at the ha in the hands of the Apostle Paul, he made every individual answerable directly to God. And as it turns out, thinking about yourself is a thoroughly biblical thing to do. Not only do we find the main characters in the Bible, or a couple of them anyway, asking, who am I? We also have the question, what is a human being? And many of the ways in which we refer to ourselves in English today actually overlap with and may derive from biblical terms, such as body, soul, spirit, flesh, mind, and heart. And the Bible actually includes the injunction to think about yourself with sober judgment. That's our uh, task together over these three nights. Now, although no Hebrew or Greek word is typically translated into English as identity in modern Bible versions, I think many words uh, have quite a wide semantic domain and may well be translated as identity or as the self. And in certain contexts, words usually translated soul and life, for example, might be rendered identity. So if you'll put up with a little bit of translator license, I'm going to retranslate bits of the Bible through the lectures to make our topic even more prominent. To give you an example, when Jesus says, your life is more than food, and clothing, we might well translate your identity is more than food and clothing. Uh, uh, Jesus pointing to the limited role of material possessions in defining a person. And when in the Psalms it says the law of the Lord refreshes the soul, it's making the claim, as Tim Keller puts it, that the Bible has the power to restore your true identity. And we could legitimately translate the law of the Lord refreshes your true identity. It sounds a bit Clumsy, I, I admit. I'll take such liberties at a few key points in the lectures uh, to drive home my point. The Bible, in fact, offers quite a radical take on identity, judging the standard identity markers to be inadequate foundations upon which to build your own identity and even warns about putting too much weight on them. Who are you? Many of us would answer in terms of our gender, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality, our culture, job, marital status, or the like, and the Bible actually reflects on many of these at great length. But to cite some of the more striking texts, according to Galatians 3.28, you are more than these, for there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male um, and female, for you are all one 
in Christ Jesus. The identity markers we're used to thinking about are important, but they're not all important. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you are more than your marital status, your occupation, your possessions. For there's a sense in which you should live as if you were not married and had no dealings with the world and did not take full possession of anything you own. Wonderfully paradoxical commands. So the traditional identity markers are treated in the Bible. Now looking ahead, the notion of people as discrete or buffered individuals, the self-made self, is actually quite novel and unusual in the history of ideas. Anthropologist Clifford Geertz puts it well, if a little, abstrusely. I love the word abstrusely because it itself is abstruse. The Western conception, this is in your notes, by the way, if you want to reread it um, after I've read it. The Western conception of the person as bounded, unique, more or less integrated, motivational and cognitive universe, a dynamic centre of awareness, emotion, judgment and action, organised into a distinctive whole and set contrastively both against other such wholes and against its social and natural background, is, however incorrigible it may seem to us, a rather peculiar idea within the context of the world's cultures. So what's he saying? He's saying that the way we do identity today is actually quite unusual. So I think Geertz raises three questions about personal identity which I'd like to address in the lectures. The first is, is the self-made self incorrigible? Can it be shifted? And in a sense, my answer is, it depends how good my lectures are, because my goal is to shift the way you do identity. So we'll see, you can tell me uh, on Thursday night whether the self-made self is in fact incorrigible. Secondly, is the self-made self peculiar? How unique is it in the history of ideas, in the history of human civilization? My answer is that it is close to unprecedented, with one exception, which I'll discuss at the end of lecture three. That's an attempt to get you to come back <laughs> on Thursday night. And thirdly, is the self-made self working? The remainder of this lecture is taken up with addressing this question. So no doubt the buffered self has opened the door to a myriad of choices and endless possibilities. Many would see the alternative as oppressive and restrictive. You do you is the emancipation of the self and the freedom for boundless self-expression. There is an upside to the way we do identity now, at least in part, but is there a downside? That's the question I want to try and answer in the rest of tonight's lecture. What sort of self does the self-made self produce? And being in education, I've decided to uh, put the self-made self to four tests. Specifically, how well does the self-made self deal with the suffering and disappointments that life throws up? How well does it deal with the pride and envy that tempt us all? How well does it deal with the existence of weak and lowly people in our world? And fourthly, with the enemies and injustice that we inevitably encounter. So if you like alliteration, these relate respectively to what we might call the existential, the ego, the ethics and the enemy tests. And I promise I didn't pick them for that reason. In each case, I'll note some social trends that have been noticed by a wide range of commentators, not just Christian ones, and then bring a strand of teaching from the Bible to the table by way of critique. And then we'll return to these same four tests on the next two nights when I'll be attempting to expound uh, the Christian approach to personal identity. And uh, we'll see against those benchmarks um, how well a Christian approach might go. Now, I'm not arguing that everyone who takes the self-made self approach to identity fail these, fails these tests. I'm asking what resources are there with the self-made self for dealing with these kinds of things? Is the self-made self equipped to deal with existence as we have it? With, it, with its ego, with ethics and enemies. So the first test, and it's, it's the longest one. So we begin with the existential test of coping with life's setbacks. 
How does the self-made self deal with suffering and disappointment? In short, I put to you, not very well. The, the buffered self cultivates unrealistic expectations for life. Now, this isn't just me. Uh, social researcher Hugh McKay has identified what he calls the utopia complex in our society, a world where we dream and think we are entitled uh, to certain outcomes that are always positive. The fifth biggest selling book in the history of the New York Times list and still popular graduation gift, Dr. Zeus's 1990 book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, unwittingly underlines this world view, I think. The book's about a boy who's reminded that he has all these amazing talents and gifts and ultimate freedom to choose whatever direction he wants to take in life. His life is about fulfilling his own desires. You're on your own, you know what to do, and you are the guy who'll decide where to go. You'll be as famous as famous can be. And in this very short book, the word you appears 90 times. It's what Dr. Zeus likely meant as a whimsical distraction, but it's become for, in our society, an article of faith. And uh, I read just the other day, waiting for my son's haircut, that it's one of Melania Trump's favorite books, which she reportedly reads often to her son, the appropriately named Baron. But are such high expectations realised in life? Is, re is, is life like that? Obviously, it's hard to generalise, but it's worth noting that along with the rise in high expectations that we seem to be breeding in our society, some economists point to what they call the precariat, uh, playing off the word proletariat. It's a growing social class formed of people suffering from precarity. I had to look that up as well. Existence without pre predictability or security. So think of lack of job security and underemployment, which seems to be, uh, both seem to be mainstays in our economy now. And it certainly seems to, uh, the, the, the precariat seems to push against this idea that you'll be as famous as famous can be. Coming briefly to the Bible, its take on the human condition actually weighs against expecting too much from life. Two frequently uh, struck notes in the book of Ecclesiastes make this clear. First is the almost nihilistic verdict on human life that everything is meaningless or futile, that opens and closes the book and is repeated throughout. According to Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless in the sense of being transitory, passing and of no lasting significance. And this includes all of the essential ingredients for a significant life, work, wisdom, knowledge, even relationships. So at this point, the Bible sounds more like waiting for Godot than, oh, the places you'll go. The second phrase, under the sun, which uh, the book of Ecclesiastes uses a kind of uh, summary description of life on earth, it occurs 14 times, and it's used to refer to the harsh environment in which humans exist. It's a phrase redolent of exertion and struggle. Uh, so when thinking of uh, living under the sun, don't think of basking on the Gold Coast, rather think of being lost in the Simpson Desert. So maybe surprisingly, the New Testament doesn't in fact dispute the verdict of Ecclesiastes that life is meaningless and we live under the sun. In fact, in Romans 8, Paul tells the same frustrating um, tells of the same frustrating character of life in the present with the glum line, the creation itself was subjected to frustration. So in effect, the Old Testament's characterization of life in a fallen world as pointless passing and without profit is matched by the New Testament's depiction of a world subject to frustration, decay and corruption. I didn't come to cheer you up tonight. And both Romans and Ecclesiastes allude to the story of the world gone wrong when Adam and Eve rebel against God and are expelled from utopia from the Garden of Eden. But don't misunderstand me, life under the sun does not replace the utopian complex with the dystopian one. Ecclesiastes acknowledges and actually recommends enjoying life's simple pleasures and joys. God wants everyone to eat, drink and experience things that are good gifts from him. But... It marries that with, with, with these kind of notes, that the human heart is easily deceived, prone to evil, the world is an unjust place, and in the end, death robs us of our accomplishments. So as much as we might like to think we are the author of our lives, 
Life's unscripted moments, redundancy, illness, bereavement, relationship breakdown and the like, mean that all of us belong to the precariat. Speaking personally, in my own life, going off the rails around the age of 40 uh, was what alerted me to the precariousness of my own existence, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the next two lectures. But I can say for now that in my late 50s as I am now, I can report that none of my peers have escaped having to cope with unexpected burdens for which they feel largely inadequate. Since we exist precariously under the sun in a world characterised by futility and frustration, then utopia is unattainable and despite our fear of missing out, we all miss out in the end. Arguably, the self-made self inflated by unrealistic expectations is ill-equipped to cope with life's struggles and may well be crushed under the weight of its disappointments. Next, the egotism test. How well does the buffered self manage pride and envy? So if the utopia complex raised the spectre of the self-made self's unrealistic expectations in life, here I want us to note the widely reported rise in narcissism. So a narcissist is someone who's pre preoccupied with themselves and constantly craves the approval of others. So psychologist Ross King claims that studies of those with narcissistic traits um, have jumped, uh, the, the numbers in our population, have jumped from 3 to 10% over the past three decades. And some health professionals speak of an epidemic of narcissism in our society. So has the focus on the self that's intrinsic to the self-made self identity script contributed to this rise in pathological self-centeredness. The message that each one of us is exceptional comes from many sides and can lead to an unhealthy pride and even arrogance. It can start young. My son's primary school has a tradition of playing a song of the week to give the preteens something to hum and ponder. A recent example was the Scripps Hall of Fame. It strikes all the right notes for a catchy tune as well as delivering an upbeat message of aspiration and ambition. Uh, the lyrics could be heard as an anthem to each child's specialness. I won't sing it. Yeah, you could be the greatest, you could be the best, you could be King Kong banging on your chest, you could beat the world, you could be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. See, the issue is closely related to the notion of personal identity. Standing in the Hall of Fame, the world's going to know your name. Indeed, the advertising for many private schools uh, runs exactly on these lines. I started to do a survey and it was just too tedious, so the first five I looked at all intended to produce exceptional young people. We won't ask the master what we're doing here, but... Uh, <laughs> the message is reinforced when people who are actually exceptional are interviewed on the radio and in the media, be they high achievers in sport or the arts or business, they typically attribute their success to working hard, following their dreams, finding themselves with the sometimes explicit message that you could achieve greatness if only you tried harder. But is that true, I ask? Surely by definition, these people are exceptions, aren't they? That's why they're being interviewed. Uh, comedian Jane Caro puts it well when she says that the constant message that we can all be exceptional is a lie, and that's OK. Well, it's not OK that it's a lie, but it's OK that we're not exceptional. You're not fabulous, nor are the men and women, uh, no matter how fabulous they may look or sound, who like to sprinkle such adjectives around. Fabulous, she's talking about. No one is. We're all flawed, insecure, tired, self-indulgent, often bewildered human beings who mostly struggle to stay on top of the demands of everyday life. Cheery, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> coming briefly to the Bible, the problem with pride, according to the Bible, is that it produces a distorted sense of self. There are a number of verses, here's just one. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. So even though the proud spend a lot of time thinking about themselves, the irony is they don't actually know who they are. So is the buffered self destined to become proud? Not necessarily. 
uh, if they make comparison with others, they might come out on the inferior end and envy would take over. So the widely reported fact that viewing social media leads to envy, I think, is hardly surprising. What you see of your friends' lives is at best a heavily curated highlight reel with many directorial cuts. And when it comes to personal identity, envy like pride takes a terrible toll. Uh, envy does the envier considerable harm. There are visual representations of envy uh, teaching about the vice in the ancient world uh, that depict the envier with dry, lustreless eyes, sunken cheeks, contracted eyebrows, emaciated bodies, and some even have the envier with their hands around their throats. According to Proverbs, envy rots the bones. Arguably, pride and envy are the consequences of an excessive focus on oneself. Now, you could do the self-made self without falling into those things, of course, uh, but uh, the self-made self in focusing too tightly on itself, I think, is prone to puncture and distortion. Uh, two more tests, uh, quite briefly. The ethics test, the weak and lowly. How well does the self-made self respond to the weak and lowly? If our culture is uh, ruled uh, by a uh, um, system of self-interest, a relentless pursuit of pleasure, built into a narrative of following your heart and achieving greatness, what room is there for the weak and lowly who come across our path or who exist elsewhere in our world? For what reasons might such people not be regarded simply as obstacles on our paths. Taking authenticity to be the sole or chief criterion for human behaviour and the main way to direct our lives, I think, raises significant concerns. On its own, the urge to be true to yourself ignores the social fabric of our existence. Relationships can easily become disposable if they stand in the way of self-expression. And Charles Taylor contends our ties to others as well as external moral demands can easily be in conflict with our personal development. How does our society do with the weak and lowly? Well, I think the attitude of the majority of, Austra of Australians towards refugees and overseas aid, which is a very easy cut in the, in the federal budget, would suggest that the needs of the weak and lowly are easily overlooked. As much as the NDIS can be celebrated, don't try putting social housing in a well-to-do suburb. It's not long before you'll be shouted down with not in my backyard, as happened in Brighton, in my city, just last week. Arguably, the self-made self, in following its heart, is prone to heartless behaviour. Uh, fourthly, the enemy test. Does the self-made self, obsessed with its own image, lack empathy for others, how can it cope when confronted with injustice? Well, I think uh, whereas once an ill-thought indiscretion might lead to being shunned at a party, nowadays one foot wrong on Twitter can lead to worldwide censure and opprobrium. As one commentator put it, especially in the online world, hatred is everywhere, empathy and its cousin civility are nowhere. We live in a culture of reflexive outrage and the phenomena of uh, internet pylons and rabid twitch hunts would suggest that the self-made self is a cranky little beast. To cite an example offline, road rage is on the rise. According to one survey, 86% of us feel aggressive behind the wheel and 20% admit to chasing other cars when driving <laughs> with aggressive intent. We won't do a show of hands just now. Although I could do it if everyone shut their eyes. <laughs> Perhaps sitting in a car alone with nothing but your own destination firmly in mind is a good illustration of the do-it-yourself identity formation strategy. And if that's the case, then re the resultant anger really shouldn't surprise us. How does the self-made self react when things go, don't go its way or when someone gets in the way? I think arguably the self-made self fostering an expressive individualism can be harsh and unforgiving when faced with opposition and adversity. So to sum up, together the four tests raise significant questions about the incorrigible but peculiar notion of 
the do-it-yourself identity? Does it have the resources to withstand hardship and disappointment? Does it lead to the distortions of hubris and resentment? Does it leave room for the weak and lowly? Does it respond to justice with proportion? I think there are good reasons to think that the self-made self can easily end up crushed, deflated, mean, mean and cranky. Um, David Brooks, whom I quoted earlier, gives this scathing critique of identity formation and the self it produces. I don't expect you to agree with everything he says, but it's, it's worth a read. We live in a culture that teaches us to promote and advertise ourselves and to master the skills required for success, but that gives little encouragement to humility, sympathy and honest self-confrontation, which are necessary for building character. Years past and pass and the deepest parts of yourself go unexplored and unstructured. You're busy, but you have a vague anxiety that your life has not achieved its ultimate meaning and significance. You live with an unconscious boredom, not really loving, not really attached to the moral purposes that give life its worth. You lack the internal criteria to make unshakable commitments, which is ironic seeing it's all meant to come from within. You never develop inner constancy, the integrity that can withstand popular disapproval or a serious blow. You don't have a strategy to build character, and without that, not only your inner life, but also your external life will eventually fall to pieces. <laughs> a humiliating gap opens up between your actual self and your desired self. Now, um, I don't imagine everyone will agree with everything that's said there, but it's quite a sobering read, isn't it? And certainly, Brooks thinks that it's worth taking another look at how we do personal identity, how we form ourselves. I think it's fair to say, Kensington, we have a problem. <laughs> While we cannot lay all the blame on the self-made self for the utopia complex, the rise in narcissism, our culture of reflexive outrage, the absence of compassion in our society, it would hardly be surprising for such an approach to produce a personal identity that is self-deceived, self-absorbed and self-centred. So if looking inwards to form the self might have some problems, as I said, you don't have to come on the whole journey to at least put a question mark beside that approach. My own modest contribution in this area um, in, is some social scientific research. So what's the alternative? What I did is what I normally do when I need to know something, turn to Facebook. <laughs> I looked at the profile pictures of my so-called 1800 friends and had a look at, uh, some of you may even find yourselves up there, which would be interesting, uh, to find out how do people define themselves. Now, this is a selection of people who define themselves as individuals. Most, and that's the case with most of my friends, but not, but there's a sizable proportion who do something else I'll get to in a moment. And then uh, that something else most commonly is to uh, define yourself in relation to others in social terms. Thank you. Um, and uh, people often put as their Facebook profile picture, uh, p p friends and family, sometimes they're not even in the picture themselves. So in defining yourself, it's possible to look to others to make some contribution to the self. And then still others post pictures that carry associations of experiences or accomplishments or passions that they believe somehow will define them. So these people that define themselves are looking backwards and forwards, if you like, at their story and their aspirations, their personality. Excuse the dad joke, but I just have one Facebook profile friend uh, that actually has a profile profile picture. <laughs> That's not true, actually, because I just remember Justine Toe has one, and, but it was too, too, too few pixels to put on the screen. So, many of my Facebook friends define themselves by looking to others and by looking to their stories. Uh, let's look at these two approaches. So, instead of looking simply inside, we might look around. And in response to the trend towards a buffered self, the social sciences are increasingly defining personhood in relational terms. Far from recommending that we find ourselves, 
Such researchers argue, as David Dropling contends, that the self is too complexly configured to be accessible to a single finite mind inquiring into itself by itself. The truth is that persons come to know themselves in being known by persons other than themselves. The limitations of self-knowledge are impressed upon me every time I go shopping for new clothes. So I'll go into the uh, change room and uh, I'll see what I normally see looking straight ahead. This is the vision, this is who I think I am, That's, but I see myself in reverse uh, on the, uh, in the mirror. But sometimes they have mirrors on different parts of the change room, don't they? And it's just horrifying to me <laughs> that, uh, that, that I, I, I think there's something wrong with the mirrors. But the truth is, you people know me in that sense better than I know myself. Because all, all I ever get is this uh, um, angle. Think too of what most of us find an unpleasant surprise when hearing our own voice in a recording. Uh, hear my voice through my skull. It sounds bad enough, but when I hear it on a <laughs> tape recording, that's sorry, my age, when I hear it on a podcast, um, it's uh, not a pleasant experience. So do we really know ourselves? Can we do our, our own identity by doing it ourselves? So when it comes to knowing yourself, social psychologists back in 1902 came up with a, a very interesting notion, the looking glass self, which uh, refers to our tendency to understand ourselves by perceiving what others make of us. In other words, the self is the result of learning to see ourselves as others see us. And uh, the new collegians, is that what you call them? Yeah. The new collegians uh, had an art show in this room. Some of their art is around the walls. And one of the winning entries is just over here on the right. And it says, I am not what I am. I am what I think you think I am. Well, it's not that far off uh, what I've just said. So I was very happy to see that on the wall there. Along with looking around, I think we need to look back and forward. Richard Borkham notes that the human self has no timeless existence outside of the temporal reality that we can only describe in narrative. I think we all know this, don't we? When we first meet someone, you might ask them um, uh, about their, uh, you, first of all, you ask them their name, and then you'll, you'll notice cert certain things about them, their rough age, their gender. Um, you might ask about their occupation. If you want to dig deeper and, uh, and get to know someone, you ask them, what's your story? Where have you come from? Where are you heading? Uh, what's your family background? And so on. You're a social being known by others, and you are your story. But I think there's a third thing, and more controversially, I submit that we need not only to look around backwards and forwards, but also upwards. Rowan Williams writes, without the transcendent, we shall find ourselves unable sooner or later to make any sense of the full range of human self-awareness. And Peter Lighthart agrees, he says, personal identity cannot be anchored convincingly without transcendence. So does looking up have a role in identity formation? Now, many of us will think, of course, that religion, looking up, is on its way out. And certainly the recent census indicates that adherence to organised religion in Australia has been in steady decline for some decades. But as it turns out, on the test of religious affiliation worldwide, the trend is uh, in the other direction. The numbers show no such decline. Only one in six people have no religion worldwide, and that is projected to decline to only one in eight by 2060. As a Fairfax article reported, Australia might be losing its religion, but the world isn't. And even in Australia, a McCrindle survey back in 2012 found that nearly one-fifth of Australians identify as spiritual but not religious, more than ever before. So being spiritual is on the rise, even if being religious is in decline. So even if looking up in the traditional terms is on the way and looking up in general is not. 
Indeed, looking up one way or another seems to be an irrepressible human urge. The idea that human beings have an incurable predilection to worship is certainly the Bible's view. According to Ecclesiastes, um, where we read earlier uh, those depressing texts, um, the crumbling foundations of personal identity are not the whole story. One note of hope is struck, the enigmatic verse where it says, God has set eternity in the human heart, a kind of God-given awareness that there's something more to life than the terrestrial. An intriguing story in Australia in this connection, in this very city, is the so-called Mr. Eternity, Arthur Stace. Uh, an illiterate alcoholic, Stace came to faith in 1930 in a Sydney church. Then for the next three decades, he preached a famous one-word sermon, writing the word eternity on footpaths all over the city. I believe his biography is coming out quite soon with the Bible Society. How did the increasingly godless city of Sydney respond to this overtly religious message? What place has talk of eternity in its secular and irreligious soul? Well, oddly, there's plenty of room apparently because without a squeak of complaint to mark the new millennium, the word eternity was emblazoned on the Harbour Bridge. And uh, as Stace had written it more than half a million times and it was viewed by um, as many as two billion people. As it turns out, many agree that looking up in one form or another is thought to be good for you. So the positive psychology guru Martin Seligman contends that human happiness depends in part on being committed to something bigger than yourself. Even Richard Dawkins admits that awe is one of the highest experiences of the human psych psyche. And according to Einstein, we're as good as dead without it. Awe makes us feel small while encouraging us to be bigger, if you like. Now, don't get me wrong, I know there are, of course, other ways of experiencing awe than by uh, looking up to God. Uh, but to finish off this lecture by returning to the Bible, it's worth noting the Bible has a sober warning that not all looking up is good for you. Tim Keller, for one, takes the Bible's warnings about idolatry to be relevant to identity formation. He writes that our need for worth is so powerful that whatever we base our identity and value on, and value on we essentially deify. According to Keller, the human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, and even family, and makes them the ultimate thing in our lives. This then leads to worshipping false gods, according to Keller. Uh, our hearts deify them as the centre of our lives because we think they can give us the significance, security, safety, and fulfilment that each of us craves. Now, in Bible terms, the problem with idolatry is not just that it's an offence to God, but the fact that idols are gods that fail. So in the ancient world, you would look to the idols for some kind of benefit, some, uh, um, uh, for, for having children or for protection, uh, for a change in the weather, uh, for success against your enemies, and so on. And idol worship, according to the Bible, leads only to the disappointment and embarrassment of those who trust in them. Thus, we may surmise one problem with deifying your work, wealth or relationships is that ultimately they will fail to deliver on their promise to give us the lasting sense of significant security and satisfaction that each of us craves. So where shall personal identity be found? Where should we look to know ourselves? In the first part of this evening's lecture, I suggested that the recent trend to look only inwards for you to do you was problematic and judging by societal trends was producing a self that is ill-equipped to respond to life's disappointments with resilience, to other human beings with appropriate humility, patience and compassion. It fails the tests of existence, ego, ethics and enemies. Instead of looking inwards, I suggest that looking outwards, backwards, forwards and upwards is the way to go. You are a social being, which is the main topic tomorrow night, and you are your story, 
which is the main topic on Thursday night, and you have eternity in your heart. In the next two lectures, I'll seek to show that looking up is the key both to the social self and the narratival self, and that the self that emerges is better equipped to cope with life's setbacks and to respond well to the ordinariness, feebleness and injustice that is the frustrating futility of human life under the sun. We now have uh, the opportunity to ask Brian some questions. And uh, do you think it is true that most humans in today's society are mostly driven by self-interest? Okay, so just to be clear, in the question time there'll be three basic answers. There'll be, I'll cover that in lecture two. I'll cover that in lecture three. And I'll ask John Dixon to come and answer. <laughs> Um, so, no, the good question, um, um, are we driven by self-interest? I, I think it, it's very, even though I've spoken of society in very general terms, um, I think the, the easiest way to answer that question is to look into your own heart. And in my case, um, I confess that all of my motives are mixed and that I do find a great struggle with self-interest. And so looking across society, I think there's good evidence, as there has always been in human history, if you look at our very chequered history, the way we uh, treat each other, uh, to say that uh, self-interest is alive and well. Uh, critical theorists sometimes speak of plural selves rather than single self. Is that something that um, you've addressed in your work, or is that going to be lecture two or three? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I haven't heard of the technical term plural selves, but certainly I'm aware that uh, one of the struggles with having a stable and satisfying sense of self in our day is the fact that our lives are so com compartmentalised. So there's, there's me at home, there's me at work, there's me in my communities, and uh, there, there are so many different me's, who's the real me? So some anthropologists have spoken about the way identity has been done in the past is it's like a river. So you're uh, taken along the river in a very specific direction and even at an early point in your life, you'll know the basic answers to the big questions of life. You'll know the type of person you'll be, um, where you'll roughly be living, the sort of person you would marry, and what your occupation might be. Probably just do, you'll do what your father or mother had done. Um, and um, the anthropologist I'm thinking of says that our society is like an ocean. And uh, you can go with every wind and current in any direction you like. There's also more chance of drowning. Is, is the way he puts it. But uh, um, so unfortunately, Andrew, I don't know specifically that technical term, but uh, that, that, that's a quick reflection. I'm Brian Kamal, we're a good PhD student for the college and many other identities as well, as you well know. Now, and, uh, my question is just to reflect on something which you sort of had going underneath your lecture. Uh, you talked about outrage culture. But very much in the lecture, you were focusing on the autonomous self-constructed self. I just wonder if outrage culture is actually much more communal. And that is especially the tweet. Now, there was a new term that you introduced me to, the, not the, the uh, Twitter outrage. What was that term again? Twitch hunts. Twitch hunts. Does anyone know what a Twitch hunt is? How many people know? Hands up if you, yeah, there's a few, yeah. a few uh, people. It just seems to be. A Twitch hunt, just quickly, a Twitch hunt is where someone uh, does something out of line on Twitter and they're hunted down relentlessly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Can you just explore that a bit? That doesn't seem to be to be particularly autonomous. That's fashionable. Yep. That's okay. In the crowd. Yep. Um, yeah, I think I think there is a, a bit of a paradox with the way we do identity in our day, in that the postmodernism has rejected the so-called meta narratives, the big explanations for all of human existence, and the way we do stories. And I'll do a little bit of this in lecture three is by having our local story or our own particular story. Our tribe is the way some people sometimes do it. But there is a sense in which um, it's still a do-it-yourself identity in that I've identified with this tribe very um, intentionally. And I dress in a certain way and behave in a certain way. I, I eat in certain places because that, that's my tribe. So um, it, 
Whether that contributes to the um, outrage culture, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm frequently baffled by how um, quickly people are offended and um, respond uh, with such vehemence um, in public discourse when a different point of view is expressed. And, and to be honest, I don't really understand that. But, but it, it certainly is a, a phenomenon. I don't know if you're going to cover it on a future topic, but if <laughs> I... Um it is true, similar to what the artwork there does say, mm -hmm. a lot of the time people do, um, you are known by how I mean, you're presented on the internet more so than um, things you've either done or people you've interacted with. Do you have, can you give maybe biblical wisdom on pragmatics and how to address, you might know what you're like, but it's, it is finding its flow when everyone keeps resourcing how they understand you from the internet, which um, <coughs> comment direction, will you address that issue? Like okay. where the reality is one thing, but the, the presentation of what people source is imposed, and therefore that then gets re further reinforced. Yep. I mean, one of the... Uh um, one of the ironies of uh, social media is that, uh, that we have a myriad of, uh, of, uh, of connections but not many attachments. So there's a sense in which having a group of people who really do know you uh, in the flesh and over a longer period of time is a really uh, valuable thing for an identity. So uh, when I had my own uh, uh, difficulties some 20 years ago, there were, there were some people, um, fortunately for me, who, who had known me for a very long time. So one of my best friends would ring me every Sunday night. Um, uh, another family had me over once a week uh, with, with my children to, uh, at their place for a meal. Another friend took me on bushwalks. Um, so there's a sense in which, um, again, it's ironic, isn't it? It would appear that we're more socially connected than ever through social media. But there is the potential, and I'm not completely down on social media, I think there are, there's great potential there, but there is the potential for um, not actually having a deep engagement with, with anyone. So another economist here in the fray, um, Gordon Enzis uh, from UTS. Um, one of the interesting conversations I have with my students sometimes is whether um, all people are equal. So when I ask them why they think they're better than animals, they often say because we have greater capabilities. So then I ask them, well, within our species, if people have more capabilities than other people, are they equal? And, and that gets some very interesting conversations going. What do you think is happening in, in, current, uh, in current society with notions of personal identity? Do you think people are still seeing themselves as equal, or do you think that's changing? Because some of my students don't think they're everyone's equal. Well, people like Peter Singer don't even see a, uh, a, a very hard distinction between human beings and animals, of course. So that, that's the first thing to say. Um, I, I think um, that they're, I, I'm a little hesitant when I hear people say, you know, we, 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 we live in a Christian society and the Christian values have shaped everything about us. It's certainly more complicated than that. But I do think that the idea that every person is of value and significance and equal in that kind of sense is a Christian notion. I mean, it's rooted very firmly in the doctrine of the image of God, that every individual is, is, uh, uh, reflects God's image. And um, I'll be talking about that in another lecture, but uh, it, it's really, I think it's to do with our status as God's offspring, um, which, which gives us um, great dignity and uh, uh, gives our work a, a great worth. And then the other thing, of course, um, in, in terms of Christian thinking, um, every person is of great value because God entered our world and uh, paid the ultimate price. And if, if you want to put a price tag on yourself, it, it, it was very costly. So the death of Christ really says that, it, which was for everyone, for the whole world, is, is something that gives um, great significance of value to every individual. Now, whether that those two things have fed through to um, the Western culture's uh, commitment to every person being of equal value, I, I don't really know for sure. 
But there does seem to be a big pushback against many Christian ideas in our culture today. And uh, maybe when you uh, pull that away, um, it's not as obvious that everyone is equal because we're not equal in terms of our capabilities or how good looking we are or um, all sorts of things. So uh, maybe the basis, the foundation for um, uh, equality um, is not as obvious. Hi, Brian. My name is Bronte. I'm a new college alumna. Um, just had a question, or perhaps um, like a humanist might object that um, just because something is self-made doesn't mean that it's selfish. So in, in response to your point about narcissism, um, is it the case that because someone goes by you do you that the result is selfish? Uh, no, it's not. And, and it's much more complicated than that, isn't it? There are so many factors that form a person um, and uh, none of us are consistent. So, um, no, I'm not, and I, and I think I tried to say that at the beginning, but let me say it again. I, I'm not suggesting that we're, um, in the simplistic terms, that the self-made self will end up failing these tests. But there do seem to be trends in society which indicate we have some problems, and, thus, and, and that does correlate with the way in which we've gone down this route of forming a buffered self, of following your heart, and uh, finding yourself. And when you put the two trends together, it, you can see connections between them. That, that's really the argument I'm, I'm putting. And um, on the next two nights, when I'll be arguing that a Christian approach to personal identity is better equipped to handle and to pass those tests, I'm also not suggesting that every person who professes to be a Christian is um, more successful at passing the tests.